Hello and thank you for downloading this episode of Radio Juxtapose. My name is Doug Gillen and together with my co-host Evan Preco, we have Aaron Johnson and Christian Rex Van Minnen in the hot seat today. I don't think we've ever used the word grotesque to describe our guests' artwork, but well, maybe today is the exception to that rule. If you want to get straight into the interview, skip to about minute 15. Otherwise, you can listen to me and Evan chatting about New York art fairs and whether or not it's okay to listen to Michael Jackson. If you do enjoy the podcast, make sure you subscribe and enjoy the episode. So how are you doing, man? Oh, man. Oh, hang on. I can't start that. That's the that's the way I start that every <laughs> single time. I say it the same tone, the same <laughs> delivery. I'm pulling that back. Let me try and find another way of introducing this. Hey, um, we should start. We're going to do this for the first time ever. Later in this conversation, we talked to Christian Rex Van Minen and Aaron Johnson the day after their joint solo show at Ross and Kramer in New York City. That's what you're going to lead up to in this conversation. I, I think it's the first time we've ever done that, like right at the beginning. That's good. Good introduction to what's to come. You nailed it, Evan. Thank you. Uh, so I assume you're back in San Francisco. You were in New York. Back in San Francisco, uh, back from a really fantastic 10 days of uh, arting in New York. Fair week. Very good. Lots of good things. Lots of good people. Action was hot. It's hot. The art world is hot. New York knows how to throw an art party. It looked, it looked good from my little uh, watching it through my 640 pixels that I'm allocated to enjoy that experience. Here's the thing I want to know. like For people who don't go for those kind of weeks, right? If you're not there, it, it, do you pay attention to like what other people are doing during those weeks? Or are you kind of just like, nah, I'm, I'm not there. I don't care. 50-50. 50 50 for the art fair weeks i'm generally i think the one that will always get me is basil whenever whenever it's whenever it's miami it's like okay i you got me i'm in the other ones i can kind of like get away with just being like i dip my toe in i'm like oh that that looks sick um but there's like there's certain people that you're like okay i want to see less of you i want to see less of what you're posting yeah and that's the thing i don't know why miami does that for people but it really does like you you feel like oh i should be there i keep thinking though that what juxpo should do is during miami week do something in a different city at the exact same time and just forget about it but i just go it (laughs) glass that's what i'm saying like do it in a kind of a random not random but just a a different place that's not miami and see like what the impact is um I don't really test your followers, but that's definitely not something that I think our publisher would be like, that's a great idea, Evan. Good job. Yeah. You are out of your mind. Uh, no, lots of good stuff. And, um, not, not just the fairs. I mean, fairs are fine, but it's just like all the shows and the museum things that are all just kind of tied into New York city. It was just, it was fantastic. Highlights. Actually, I was just going through the highlights. Uh, there, I was just going through the highlights cause I'm going to do a post on juxpose.com today of my, 10 favorite things from the fairs but um i'm a sucker for it but like seeing all the warhol work together at the whitney was pretty cool i mean it's like the greatest hits but like whatever those are great hits right those are like defining 20th century hits right it's a solid collection of hits if there's gonna be a set of hits that's a good set it's like listening to like the beatles number ones it's like yeah those are good Uh, those work not like listening to michael jackson number ones though oh bro Bro, a lot, a lot happened in the last since our last uh, podcast, man. Did you watch the documentary? I refuse to. I know. I. I know oh I wait, shouldn't. wait! Don't refuse it. I know society. I just. I have. He was such a big part for me, man. He was the reason I got into music. He was. He was everything. Absolutely everything for me as a yeah. Kid. But what you're um, basically saying is that I mean, you that's the equivalent of what three billion people on the planet are saying today. He's the reason why I got into pop music. First off, like. Pop music's not that great. Second, like because it died after he after he sort of like killed the game. Everyone went, "Okay, we'll just try and be as good as Michael Jackson and never get as close." He sort of killed the game in 88 when he put out Bad. Like it wasn't or maybe 89. It wasn't the greatest of albums. It was good. It was a solid album. Look, man, it, all his disco stuff from the earlier days was far far above and beyond, but there was some good stuff even in the 90s, man. Here's my thing about all pop stars who are um, having moments of, um, like, you know, historical, re- you know, being rewritten in history uh, at the moment for bad things they might have done. 
We have enough pop stars. You can go on to the next one. Ooh. We do. We have enough pop stars. We, I mean, we got, we can. Yeah, but that's the ones that are living. That's the ones like Ben, Chris Brown, and R. Kelly. Like, how they are still going, I have no idea. But can we, you know, I think they're going to, there's rumors of them coming for Kurt Cobain now. And it's like, ah, oh, damn. I got nothing. I mean, it, it, it turns out that all our all the people that we liked were massive dicks. And right. All having to figure out how to come to terms with that. <sighs> don't like pop stars. Don't like people. I don't know. I don't know. It's like it's a really weird thing. It's like you know, here you hero worship um, doesn't last, and uh, I think you should watch the documentary because it, it's, it's very fascinating. It's more of a fascinating. I, I, it's more of a fascinating story about um, the way that power manipulates and the way that hero worship kind of plays into the the myths um and it, that's just fascinating to me uh I, I think that kind of storytelling is is fascinating at some point it's just i'm clinging on as long as i can but it's a total test of the the, the moralometer you know for everyone else it's like cool i don't mind boycotting r kelly's music because i've never bought r kelly's music so it's easy for me to just to pass that off when it's someone that you really do hold close to you then it, it's a test. You know, I've listened to Miles Davis's music for years, and he wasn't the nicest dude to women, men, everybody. Uh, so I have to do a little soul searching often when I'm listening to music. So I'm not like this isn't like I'm on like on my soapbox being like hey, everybody needs to listen. You know, like I, 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 it's very complicated. I think it is, and I think there will be a degree, and 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 maybe this will come back and bite me in the ass. But I think there will be sort of like a a degree of a, a statue of limitations on this. I think now while this documentary is out, it's like right for everybody to ban. I think what's going to happen is you're going to see time go by and then it'll be like, oh, let's just throw in a little Billy Jean there, a little, a little bit of smooth criminal. And I think it will start to become a little bit less of a hot topic than it is today. Kind of like Miles Davis. You know, you could still play Miles Davis in the radio. Can before. you separate the artist from the art I mean, can you separate the person from the art, I should say? With regards to Jackson, I feel like I can because I never, we never really knew. I think everybody knew there was something up because the rumors and the allegations were around his entire career. I mean, the dude was black when he was born and he was porcelain white by the time he died. Like there was definitely some stuff going on with this guy. You know, I think if we all like took our head out of the sand, we would have always known that. So with him, with him, I probably can because like I, 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 his personality, his weirdness was never part of my enjoyment. His attitude and his style and and his energy and, and, and just the songwriting, that was what made him the guy for me. I I definitely feel like as you get older, you are faced with these decisions a lot more often. The whether to uh, love the art, and not like the person, or to separate that kind of that fine line of um, behavior and then the output. Who's who's your biggest one that you like? You really struggle with? Ooh, that's a good question. For a while, I struggled with John Lennon because I knew he was not really the best man. Uh, with his first wife and his first kid, that was a little difficult um, to come to grips with a little bit, because um, the Beatles were such a big part of my childhood and continue to be a big part of my adulthood. Uh, Miles Davis is a little complicated, um, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty uh, strict. I can, I can shed people quickly. Yeah, you don't, you don't hold people too close. For, for any length of time. Yeah, I can I can sh I can shed, but I do have a little bit of a hard time. Like if I really like a piece of art, and this is what's different about music, right? Is that music it, it's it engulfs your life in such a unique way, whereas physical installation painting art is like such a it's a different sort of personal experience that like I it's easier to separate a painting from the artist. I feel like at times than music for me personally. Because there's a constant visual representation put in front of you. You know, you don't necessarily constantly see. Uh, I'm trying to think of anyone that without without dragging them into this well of like, what did Bailey do? He didn't do anything. I mean, it's like I like like Bacon, Freud, Picasso, just like these male 
ego artists like there's something about their male ego and their lives that i kind of like find i find like that is intrinsic in the work and i kind of like that um but if i found out that all the painters i liked both male and female were problematic i could still probably enjoy the the output whereas music i'm having a harder time i don't know why but then with art it's that kind of like well you can still enjoy it but it doesn't mean that you're going to hang it in your living room 100 percent you know, it's like, okay, I can go to a show, experience it, take something away, but it doesn't mean like I'm necessarily putting my hand in my pocket and, and, and then displaying it for all to see. Right. So I played this game the, over the last week um, since I've watched the documentary of how many times I hear Michael Jackson's music involuntary. And the moment I wanted to start playing this game, I heard it in the taxi cab. So I was like, okay, all right. So that's one. Then I heard it in like a clothing store. Okay, that's two. This was in the first hour of me playing this game. And like, uh, uh, and so then you're like, it, so there is a little bit more all encompassing uh, part of pop music. I, because I haven't seen the film and he's, it's been popping up in my news feed so much. I just started going back through, like, I just started on the leave, it Al leave me alone video. And I was just like watching it. Dun -dun -dun, and I was like, okay, this is, and then I went on to like smooth criminal live at Wembley 1988. And then next thing I know, it's like oh, yeah. half an hour later, I'm standing in my bed screaming, heal the world. And I was just like, oh man, I can't. I can't get rid of this. There's no way this guy's going out my life. I, this sounds bad, but like, see, to me, like the heal the world era is just such garbage. Oh yeah, the the it was the it was the sort of scream the holier than the oh. holier than thou kind of uh, idea. That was that the Earth song, like you were not alone. That was a bad Michael Jackson period. Oh, you were not alone. I forgot about that. Oh, that was I think God. that was like definitely definitely one of the worst. But there was some good stuff still coming out in that age. Anyway, but yeah, no, I mean, the gist of the, you know, the, the reason why it's interesting to bring up is because it's just that idea of, um, I just, it fascinates me, the, the separation of output and uh, personal life. I think that's just such a fascinating thing that for the last two or three years now, throughout the, for the majority of the Western world, this has been a conversation and we're all kind of coming to grips with it. And this is a little bit what Christian and Aaron kind of get into too, is like how to, internalize and how to create art in a time where identity and searching for identity is is evolving in a very fascinating way so it this does lead into as much as aaron and christian are like why are you guys talking about a about a petty movie yeah i think the internet has definitely exposed all the things that we just quite happily buried in the sand and it's now kind of reached that point where it's like okay you really can't bury this in the sand anymore because there's going to be people that are constantly screaming at you until the change is made and for so many things it's like yes that's amazing great we're taking action on climate change we're, we're making the world a better place not to paraphrase michael jackson um see there we go the, reference number three the other things is a little bit harder when it comes down to you know your identity and like uh, especially with christian you get that sense of like there there's just that uh, like a weight on the shoulder that sits there that he just kind of like as as you kind of go through just trying to come to terms with your identity your history and everything that you kind of that you've been brought into, which is is not necessarily your choice or anything to do with you. Yeah, and I was thinking about this going through the art fairs, even from Miami and just into this last week. Um, I feel like there's been some very, very literal and and well done literal interpretations of the time we're in. Um, just it, just like very blatant political statements that um, are with both nuance and you know latency but still uh very direct kind of conversations with the now whereas christian and aaron are kind of they were talking about doing the opposite a little bit uh this not not so direct commentary about the moment they're in but like a, a more internalized approach and that was interesting based on like what i'd been seeing earlier in the week of just like very like hard-hitting political art that really kind of tells you what it's about um which is and it was good Whereas this is like a lot more subtle, which I think is interesting as well. All my responses are going to be yep or nope. We are at Ross and Kramer Gallery, where you guys just had an opening last night. Is yeah, this the second 
of like your two person shows yeah. this year. Yeah. Or uh, it. We did 18, the last 18 one and 19. four months ago. Yeah. In Hong Kong. So you guys are used to each other. Yeah. Yeah. We're good friends. How did they, we still are good friends. You still we were good friends before we started collaborating too. Yeah. There's like the second show start kind of getting like, I don't even like this guy anymore. I was going to ask how you guys got together then. Was it just sort of like a, a, a sort of a, a drawing to the the grotesque that pulled you together? Or were you actually friends before? Or where where is the connection from? We were talking about this a little bit yesterday about where we first came exposed to each other's work. And I feel like I might have seen Christian's work on Juxtapose first. I don't know if that's possible in like 2006, 2007. Mm-hmm. Or we both... We were both showing with a gallery in Barcelona in 2007-ish, like a, a gallery that briefly existed. So we knew each other's work, at least through them, if not before. I kind of remember knowing his work before and like seeing the name and this, this totally bizarro kind of weird, grotesque art like I've never seen before. And I felt like he was probably some 85-year-old like Dutch guy. I don't know. <laughs> Which you are. It's weird. In, in spirit. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, actually, at some point, and, and, and now seems like the logical time to do this, and I hope you take this the right way. That is that is definitely your, your real name. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. Okay. Feels like an 85-year-old Dutch guy. I can picture a guy with a monocle and a kind of a, a cape. And I was wondering, uh, just to go kind of in, is that, that name, that heritage, a kind of like where you got pulled into to the sort of that Dutch golden age, uh, that style? Was it kind of like researching? Is there any kind of connection between your heritage and the, and the old masters and the, and the work itself? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, it's kind of a chicken and the egg thing. My dad's name is Rex Van Minen, so I got the majority of his name. And, you know, I, I was just drawn to that particular period in art history because of the detail and the the quality of light and realism, I feel like that's where oil painting reached its zenith. So I think artistically I was drawn to that genre, but there is also, you know, a connection to it in a roundabout sort of way. Our family is five generations removed from Holland, but, you know, I still think about what is my connection to that time and place and movement and art. I always think that amazing with um, with Americans, especially because you guys always tend to know way more about your history than we do over here and where your your family lineage kind of goes back. Because over here, we're just like, yeah, I'm from Scotland. You know, that's that's it. I've, I've probably always been here from here. Uh, but y- y- like whenever I meet Americans, they can usually go back like three or four generations quite easily. Yeah, yeah. My, mine's a little harder to trace. My, my dad was born in South Africa. And um, came here in the late seventies. Um, but yeah, I, I I do understand what you're saying. I think Americans are just like we because there are so many different cultures. I think we're just kind of pre predisposed, predestined, just to kind of like want to know where we all came from, just mm-hmm. to kind of make sense of why we all ended up where we were. Because like for like a lot of us, our families came here less than 100 years ago. Yeah. Right? So it's just kind of like, it's still like a constant conversation if your grandparents were still alive or mm-hmm. um, it was just always a conversation around the dinner table, at least for me. I, I don't mean, Aaron, where, where's your... Mm, my family is from Scandinavia, more or less, like Norway, Sweden. But yeah, my dad's side of the family came over from Norway. My mom's side is a little more interesting. They... They were Swedes that were missionaries in India, in like Northeast India, for generations, and that's where my mom grew up. Uh-huh. Okay. And they would go back and forth to like Minnesota to like have the children born in Minnesota for like birth certificates, and then <laughs> so, and then back to India. So she grew up there. So I grew up with a like really like Minnesota white bread American kind of family life in the Midwest, like as American suburban as can be, but. Uh, a lot of like Indian culture, um, surrounded by like um, that's oh, one of yeah. my first like deep. <laughs> that's I think that's I was, like, so, five or six. <laughs> that's so good. Well, so, teaching moment. I mean, yeah, teaching. <laughs> yeah. Moment. Well, you know, it's interesting. Like, I was thinking about like going. I mean, Doug, sorry, you couldn't. You're not here for the show. Um, yeah. But you, you, I, and I, we'll get to you in a second on this. But Aaron, you've. I mean, a lot of people knew you from kind of the, I guess we can call them, like painting collages with like mm-hmm. objects. 
that you've and now you've kind of you're working on painting in yeah. a different way. Like you've gone through like a transformation in the last couple of years that's like pretty it's it's yeah. it's like it's still you but it's it's there's a change. Yeah, right? big change. Yeah. Big change. Um more recently before this new body of work it was sock painting. So yeah, right. canvas is loaded up with old socks in like an impasto kind of way or small kind of low relief sculpture elements made out of socks and stuck onto the painting. So clunky Funky, kooky, weird things. And I was doing that for maybe six years or so pretty consistently. And before that, there was like reverse painted, super slick, like super detailed mm -hmm. polymer paintings. Right. I feel like yeah, yeah. those are like almost forgotten now. Yeah, like, yeah, like, yeah. Now, now like, oh, he was the sock guy. And now he's doing this. But it, was, <laughs> it was like, oh, he's the sock guy, but he used to be this reverse painting guy. So yeah, it's, well, there's always this, he used to be that, and now he's doing this kind of narrative with my work. That was like the... You know, I moved to New York in 2012 and got to meet Aaron for the first time. Like, we'd been friends online and through social media, but actually met in 2012. And it was not long after that that you did this hard left into the soft territory. And I remember coming yeah. to your studio, like, right at that transition and just being like, holy <laughs> shit. Like, what the yeah. fuck? Man? <laughs> it was, like, really impressive and also, like, oh, my God. What was the catalyst for that, for the socks? Um, I wanted to get out of like a way that I had been working that felt really, really stagnant and repetitive. And it was just like, I felt locked into a certain technique, which was super, super tight and tiny brushes and just like endless days and hours and weeks of like tiny details going into every painting. And I wanted to get painterly. So I actually tried to just start painting on canvases like a normal painter. And I found I didn't really know how to do it, but what I wanted to do was stick stuff on the canvas, which was like really the most opposite thing I could do from the reverse paintings, which were super, super slick. So when I just approached a raw canvas, I was like sticking crap from the studio floor or taking walks around the neighborhood and finding junk and just gluing it on the canvas and throwing all that stuff away. But the socks, as soon as I started putting socks on the paintings and I stuck with that, they go, oh, phone call, My, <laughs> yeah. um, sock expert calling out. Um, <laughs> just yeah. double checking just yeah but i think the socks were like sense of humor absurd sort of a dadaist sort of thing and and really just wanting to make like chunky expressionist paintings and so what i'm doing now i feel like i've been trying to get to for a while just like approaching a canvas with just paint and doing something that i feel good about with that like the most traditional kind of simple approach well i feel like it's funny because both of you and i was thinking about this on my way here that and Emily Mae Smith actually mentions this in her interview in Juxtapose this mm. month. Like she was doing figurative painting when like it wasn't cool at the moment. Like when she was first starting, she was like, it was all about like abstraction and street art or whatever was going on in the world at the time, like in the kind of mid 2000s, kind of going into like 2010, 2012. But you guys kind of stuck with this sort of like canvas painting approach that was kind of like at the time, and honestly, it was like out of fashion, but it was a little oh, like, sure. it was a no. little bit, it was like, having a little bit of fun in the studio was sort of out of fashion yeah. and like you guys kind of stuck with it. And right now painting is like some people are back into paintings. Mm -hmm. I, I feel, I feel like, I mean, you guys might have a different story, but what kind of kept you like, all right, we're not going to go with like these trends that were like hot at the time. It's just what you were into personally, obviously. Yeah. It's just, you know, what I love to do. I mean, it's kind of simple. Yeah. It's like, that's what I get. But did anyone straight. tell you like, you know, oh yeah, painting's not cool right now. Like you guys should be trying to do something else. Oh my god, years of. I mean, I tried to come up through the Denver art scene, um, you know, in the early two thousands, mid two thousands, and yeah, that was the unanimous response. Was like, this is I feel like it was ridiculous. Like and Denver was like nature and kind of like more like yeah, environmentally or, or like kind of, of very palatable abstract work or you know bronze cougars and elk. <laughs> Yeah, you know, yeah, but and it's you know, awesome. so it's a lot of rejection, and then then I discovered, you know, juxtapose and social media, and found this like digital out, mm -hmm. you know, where, you know, it, it was just accepted for for what it was. It was kind of an amazing moment. But do you did you guys have actively have gallerists who were kind of like I don't know about mm -hmm. this? Well, yeah, no, I mean, when did you when did you move to New York? Nineteen ninety nine. Okay, just so you've been here a while. I just yeah. had twenty years this year. Okay, yeah. I had one gallerist one time tell me that I had one painting that was semi-abstract, but it was a bunch of arms, like arms just kind of tangled up. 
And he told me that if I put a face on it, then he could sell it. So, so no, I've never had anyone tell me I should like make an abstract painting, but I've had someone tell me that I should not make an abstract painting. Wow. Yeah. Well, it was something for someone to focus on, I guess. Yeah, I think yeah. it's like once you get branded as like a thing. Yeah. So you're a figurative painter, then you're a figurative painter. Right. I actually had a different gallery, a different show, where there was a series of paintings on American flags, and this was in 2008. And the, the figures would be like Uncle Sam on a camel or like Jesus fucking the Statue of Liberty, like really political, like George Bush Americana kind of stuff. Through the sequence of those paintings, like the monsters would sort of disintegrate and dissolve into like splatters, and there were a couple paintings that were full on just splatter, no figure. But I called them like exploded figures. But the gallery, when they saw those, they were like, "Well, he got lazy with these ones," yeah. and and I still have those two. Like yeah. all the figurative ones sold, those ones didn't. But I think it's just like you get branded as you know a figure painter or an abstract painter, and then people expect that of you, right? But, or or if you're a figurative painter, like I would get a lot of a lot of the response I would get early on was like. You know, you can paint this. Why are you painting this horrific stuff? Really? Like, why don't you paint something? Yeah, nice you guys get labeled nice. as like the gross out painter sometimes, yeah. <laughs> which is like a weird thing to me too, because it's like that's you can fucking look at the goddamn painting and not yeah. like, but that's like right. that's definitely something that like both of you kind of have this like, oh, that's like that's intense. It's hard to look at. There's something. There's deformity. There's like yeah, ghostly sure. elements. It's it's kind of like a, mm-hmm. but that doesn't especially nowadays. That doesn't seem to be. People aren't necessarily turned off by that now, or or they seem to be. Times have changed a little bit. I mean, I try to balance it. I, I mean, the the dynamic between attraction and repulsion is is the whole energy source that I'm trying to tap into. So it can't be too far in either direction. Do you do you ever have someone buy your work that you like? Huh? I wouldn't have seen that. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say there's like a certain. Uh, type of person that buys my work. That's always it's always surprising to see uh, who actually is willing to hang these things in their their homes. Yeah, it's not it's not who you'd expect. <laughs> it's a big broad range, right? Yeah. But do you have people who kind of who tell you like I love what you guys do, but I can't hang it in my house. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's a lot. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, because that is, I could see people respecting you as both of your techniques, but being like, but I don't know. Christian, I don't know. There's, there's some deformity here. Or Aaron, I don't know. I don't know. Like it might scare my children. That's kind of interesting that we're at a point where art artists have this relationship with people where you can be fans of the artist and like sort of participate in their career, but not necessarily. I don't know. Commit. Is there anything that you guys like like that is totally just? I mean, like would surprise us. You're like, well, I really like this painter. I'm like, what the? Like, you know, like, is there? People mm-hmm. that do you find yourself gravitated towards the work kind of style that you guys paint, or do you, are you kind mm-hmm. of all, no, over the place? all over the place? Yeah, I like a lot of abstract painting lately. <laughs> Here um, we go. Uh, <laughs> me too. Like, like if it's process oriented and just like really smart in like a direct kind of minimal way of making a painting with interesting process, like that's that's always that always speaks to me. Yeah, but I think my paintings are especially now. I think my paintings are half kind of in that mode. Like, yeah. Like these paintings in this show are are figures that are kind of stains, like watery, watery acrylic stains in the canvas of figures that sort of bleed into each other and they're ghostly. But they're semi abstract because it's about like how the paint bleeds into the canvas. That's right. like that's the ab- abstraction of it. They're like the formalist sort of painter of that. And then there's these like green semi circular forms that are called bushes. But they might be clouds, but they're also just kind of like an abstract device to organize the space in the painting. So when I'm working on them that way, like my brain really flips away from them being figures or being a landscape at all. It's about like organizing the space of the painting. So, so sometimes when I see paintings that are purely abstract with no like no figures in them, I, I definitely relate to it. Yeah. I've been obsessed with this artist, uh, Bram Bogart. Do you know who that is? he's a swiss artist i think he died um some years ago but his work is getting having this resurgence and there are these giant massive abstract paintings like the paint is like you know a foot thick like it looks like cement mixed with paint and it's really grotesque in the in its abstraction yeah so you know i'm attracted to that that dynamic attraction repulsion and it can exist in non-figurative work 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I see you toying with that. I see you, Aaron, toying with that, mm -hmm. which is always inspiring. I mean, I feel like I'm always kind of like watching what Aaron is doing and like terrified that it's going <laughs> to like leak into my work and start to <laughs> yeah. destabilize my, my control and shit. I was going to ask about your sculpture. Was this the first time that you've actually created a piece together? In Hong Kong last November. Yeah. Okay, so so you have before. So how does how does that process work for both of you? And can you maybe kind of like verbally visualize what it is that you you, you kind of create when you when you partner up? Yeah, it's super super fun and weird and just kind of. I think we're trying to like provoke each other with sending mm -hmm. each other something that's like, look at this fuck, <laughs> look at this fucking thing I'm gonna send him that he has to deal with. Like the one I did for Hong Kong, I was showing everyone in my studio first. They're like. You're gonna send Christian that? It was, it was like a tangled up mess of socks that were like dipped in paint and dipped in glue to get stiff. But it was, it was hard for me to even keep it together. It just kept wanting to collapse, and it was like really grotesque and strange. And material wise, I just didn't couldn't imagine Christian's like pristine kind of oil painting techniques working on that or what the fuck he would do with it. So that was really interesting. And he sent me like. <laughs> A bust, like shoulders, very classical, like shoulders, neck, and a head. The head was totally blank. The neck and shoulders were like really realistic flesh through like cold wax and oil paint. And then the Christian's like typical tattoos in, in the flesh. So he sent me that. And when I first got that, I was like treating it so <laughs> preciously, like wrapped it all in plastic and started gingerly like working on the head. But then I realized I just needed to like dig a big old hole in the head so i got out like spade bits on my drill and started like boring into it totally and realized violated me. Yeah, <laughs> just, and realized like the, the piece would be best if both of our hands were over the totality of it so it wasn't just like shoulders and neck is christian's head is mine so the hard part was to like bore holes into the part that he had done down below um, it really felt like I was violating his work. <laughs> did you wait? But, did you did you like tell him hand drilling into your shit? No. Or did you not? Yeah. And I was filling the holes with like luminescent, like cobalt blue mm -hmm. acrylic gel. So it's really, I don't know, really weird thing like under the surface of his skin. So that was Hong Kong. Like we decided to make busts. Like, I would start one. He would start one. Christians in Santa Cruz. I'm in Brooklyn. So we'd have to ship them to each other and finish them. And then for this one. Round two here in New York, when we were in Hong Kong hanging out, we were talking about this and like, we should do this, we should do more of this. And maybe we should just start making parts, like whatever those parts are and just ship them to each other. So random body parts through the mail. Does it, does it have an element of trying to like out grotesque or out kind of like weird each other just in like in, in material or element? A little bit. Like part of it's just things I want to make. So I made like a rotary phone out of socks and I, I just want, really wanted to make that, and I also knew that it would be a really s stupid and weird thing for Kristen to open up the box and find <laughs> that and be like, what the fuck do I do with this? Yeah. And a fish. I made a fish. Uh, I made a lot of sock fish, but <laughs> I made a fish out of socks and like painted it bright gold, sent him that. He turned it into a rainbow trout with like, beautiful oil glazes. <laughs> and he sent me like these fragments of bodies, like a big shoulder blade and a big uh, sternum and... I, yeah, I didn't know what they were or what to do with them at all. I feel like those packages definitely would have been flagged going through customs. <laughs> I guess what I was thinking, like, how, the, how did this... <laughs> like, here's just a, here's a part of a, a kid. It, the, the show in November in, in Hong Kong, Hong Kong's a very international city, so it's not necessarily like you're showing in mainland China or even in Tokyo or, or Korea. But um, how, does, how did the Asian audience take to your work? Like, do you notice like there's like a little bit of a like oh these are the crazy Americans who are coming in with their like like was is there any sort of um I feel like we were branded that way yeah yeah right that's what I, like, yeah just all, like when you guys got there and they yeah, met you guys are like I know like, like yeah. you look at Aaron and I and it's like we're not that we're not like the crazy guys I mean Aaron has tattoos but do you not have any yeah. tattoos no I don't yeah, have any. You don't have any tattoos and all your like all your work has tattoos no I mean like. I have all these ideas, but then they just end up in the paintings, and it would be weird to like copy it onto my mm. skin. I don't know. I'm on the fence about it. Okay. But I'm gonna get one of Christian's tattoos on me, not like a teddy bear melting off my face or anything, <laughs> but like um, one of his surfers. So get like a surfer on my leg. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So like, yeah. So you guys show up in in Hong Kong, and you're not those guys. No, 
And I mean, you could play it up if you really wanted to. Yeah. You're not, you guys, it's not like... Christian was wearing a custom-made Hong Kong suit. Yep. I was wearing a thrift store suit. So we were, we were just guys in suits, and they were yeah. like, you guys should be the dealers. And yeah. You know, I show the dealer is like super colorful, like bright yellow tropical shirt. And we look like ministers on an evangelical <laughs> mission. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what I like about Eric. I mean, like, I, I kind of, you, you have a little bit of that vibe. I yeah. feel like I have a little bit of that I'm, vibe. I come from Baptist minister, and my grandfather was a Baptist minister missionary. Yeah. And we have this, like, deep, repressed psychosis. Yep. And yep. we share that together and put it to work. Yeah, right. And then you, you brought it to Asia, and you, they were not. They <laughs> they, were, I, you know, like, I didn't get a, it's a little bit, they kept their cards a little close to the chest, I felt yeah. like. Um, so I didn't, like, no one was like, oh, you know, you're crazy or anything like that. Mm -hmm. was, yeah, I think they appreciated the work. And, you, yeah. know, you know, there's a range of what the gallery shows. They show a lot of sort of, like, more pop sort of oriented, like, right. Asian painting, like, that kind of stuff. So I, I do feel, feel like we were sort of the, the transgressive, like, weird element coming into the program. But, Although you guys do fit into their program quite well. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, they do have, like, a pretty surreal media. Yeah. I mean, definitely some of their classic Japanese artists are, are kind of the kind of things when it comes to America, you're like, I don't know about in America if you can have, like, this kind of sexuality or, you know, yeah. this kind of Im imagery. So it's kind of a weird exchange. Totally. Like, the, totally. And the way that especially Japanese artists kind of worked in, like, the 60s and 70s and right. into the 80s where it's kind of like, Oh man, like in America right now, it's like, right. hey, that's me tuned out. You know, like they right. can't. Like the Rocky. Yeah, yeah, oh, right. yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, I love all that stuff. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Do you guys both feel that what is happening in the real world uh, feeds into your into your paintings at all? Current events, political events, political turmoil, things like that. Does that feed into your process in some way? Because I get a sense that there's certainly plenty of history and plenty of battling there. Um, so how much, to what extent, does what's happening just now around the world feed into into your practice? For me, currently, I feel like my work is like the least political that it's been in a while. And I think that's like a reaction to um, the Trump era, like the Trump era dawned on us, and I, I thought I was going to have to start making these horrible, grotesque Trump monster paintings. Like, I had sketches of them, they were in my head, and I sketched a couple up on canvases in the studio to start them, and I just couldn't do it. Like, I couldn't bring that into my studio. So, I think actually what I'm doing now is more escapist from that, or I don't know how to say it, but trying to access like a higher vibration of what humanity can be so i actually think the paintings i'm doing right now are supposed to be really feel good like transcendental kind of spiritual paintings and that's how i, I feel when i'm making them and it's funny that i'm saying that since we just talked about like how grotesque my work is but i feel like i have like a different barometer for grotesque because to me the grotesque is almost gone from these new paintings but <laughs> yeah other people look at them and they're like no they're still scary but like, there's but there's like uh both of both of you guys and you can answer the political sure. stuff next but like there's there is a playful nature to the works that like i think is important to touch on like you guys are having fun so much fun yeah, yeah like i think that's something yeah. that like again is nice and i feel like in maybe per perhaps like subconsciously you're like there's so much bad stuff. Like mm -hmm. I'm gonna have a little bit of fun mm -hmm. and just kind of not es escape it, but like also just kind of like the, the reaction to Trump is to have fun, perhaps. Yeah, it's important. Or like to to re to maybe think a little bit in terms of comedy of errors, or like because this this error is gonna end. Mm -hmm. It's gonna end probably fairly soon, hopefully. Let's hope so. Knock on wood. Um, mm -hmm. But like. It, it, there is. A, I mean, I was walking through it last night. I was like laughing. I was like, this is kind of uh, like good. it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. But I also know that, and you can speak on like your, yeah. the way you're reacting politically, but I, I think that the fun part of it is forgotten sometimes with both of your works. I, I think painting is always fun, just the act of painting. The content's not always fun. I mean, I, the way that this, the, the political atmosphere has filtered into my work is, um, my work's always looking inward, and all this stuff has had an impact on me, and thinking about my part in things. Um, you know, it's not new for the Trump era. That's kind of been at the core of my work for from the beginning. Is you know, how do I become a better person, essentially? And I think painting very much facilitates that and is illustrating that process in my life. So, you know, thinking about 
yeah, my place in the world, my place, um, what it means to be a man now. And, uh, you know, all, all everything that's going on, I'm not, you know, it's all finding purchase in me and I'm processing it and it's tough. You know, I've had to ask myself some really tough questions. Um, and, you know, that those paintings, like that's what that process looks like. I meant to say at the start, this is uh, International Women's Day. We had, we had lined up a female guest earlier in the week and then it kind of fell through and it was like, okay, so as a response to having a female guest on, we've got two men. We're, we're all feminine men, though. Well, we're all battling. We're all battling in our certain ways. Yeah, I think so. Well, uh, you know, the, the, the six paintings are called Anima Surf and they're all e examinations of my own understanding of Anima, which is the feminine archetype in the unconscious like what does that mean to me what is my own femininity and how is that you know either repressed or being encouraged to be part of a complete psychic makeup um so i'm, I'm curious how what other men are undergoing that process like mm -hmm. examining masculinity or oh, yeah and, and what that did you grow up in an overly like traditional masculine environment yeah, I mean, I grew up in Colorado and mostly Western Colorado, so there's a lot of that. Um, but, you know, my parents were very um, not that, I, I, I guess. Um, you know, my dad is a, a psychotherapist, so that the language of the psyche and, and how to be complete or, or be looking towards growing in that way was always part of the conversation. Um, so it was an interesting dynamic that, that, that was, that conversation was always happening at home, that kind of guidance, but what I was experiencing outside was, you know, yeah, definitely that kind of tough guy, you know, masculine, feminine, binary, um, to the extreme, I think. If you're a guy, you fight. And if you're a girl, you put on a pretty dress. Yeah. A lot of fighting. Aaron, yeah. do you have like a similar sort of upbringing? Mm-hmm. Well, for one thing, I have four sisters, so I grew up with a lot of ladies in the house. That helped. Um, I don't know. I'm, I, I relate to what Christian's saying. I feel like in this era, a lot of us have to question like our masculinity or check ourselves or like think back on incidents or, or phases in our, in our growing up or maturing where we were kind of asshole guys. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't know. I think what's really interesting in, in Christian's work is this like self-actualization through um a really deep understanding of, of Jungian psychology in a way that I'm always learning more about Jungian psychology through talking to Christian about his paintings um and I think it's really fascinating um for me like the paintings are more intuitive not based on like specific psychological ideas or system but I think there's something in common that we're both going through like a self-actualization or like what Christian said about becoming a better person. Like, I do think there's less violence in my paintings now. Um, there used to be more like explicit sexuality in my paintings that doesn't feel right to me now mm -hmm. to be doing that. Mm -hmm. But not that I, I just I, feel I that I saw that as being a positive thing though in your work. Like I, I was yeah. never, it never looked exploitative or anything. Yeah, I guess it was kind of like equilateral. It was like men and women, and it wasn't like I didn't think that it was like male gaze based. Mm -hmm. But but you start rethinking that. Yeah, like there's a little bit of like even if like you're saying you didn't observe it, but he was feeling it maybe a little bit. Like mm -hmm. it's interesting how in just the last couple of years, you're like but you kind of check yourself. Well, like okay, why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Like what is the reason? Instead of just like the gut uh, feeling of doing a creative action, like you kind of like oh, wait, okay, so yeah, what yeah. is it? When you, you've done, you do like interactions with people on Instagram when you're painting. Yeah. Has that language changed in the last couple of years? Mm. You mean the way that I... The way that people interact with you. The way that people are mm. contributing to those conversations. Like, does it change at all? Or is it well, so... Like, <laughs> I know, I've watched some of it, I'm like, Jesus. Yeah. But like, yeah, I mean, is there like any sort of... I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I get good questions. Like, you know, I, I think... Better than in the past. Different. Yeah, more pointed, and I, I, I guess I feel a greater responsibility to answer, honestly. Oh, okay. 
Um, but like the the live Instagram tattooing, I yeah. mean that's just madness. There's no <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's yeah, no okay. questions. It's just just for the listener, can you maybe go explain what the what that is? So like every twentieth painting or something like that, I'll um, when the Grisai stage is finished, I'll go live on Instagram and do a, a flesh glaze and oil. And while that is wet, I will tattoo the comments as they're coming in on Instagram live. So as fast as I can, I mean, they, they're coming in at such a clip. I can only get every 10th comment or so because I have to paint it. So I'm holding the phone and they're seeing my brush tattooing their comments on usually a, a giant head. Um, and I don't discriminate. So sometimes people will say some really awful shit mm. or just be like, you suck or, or you're ruining it. Or I can hear you wheezing, you know, <laughs> like that, like, it's like so, that goes right on there. So, so you get that's through one fun. comment and then as soon as you finish that one, the next one that comes up yeah. is automatically the next comment. Like exactly. you're, not, you're not filtering or choosing whatsoever. No, re- I'm reluctantly, you yeah. know, cause sometimes it's like, Oh my God. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, and sometimes I'm writing in Russian and I have no idea. <laughs> <what they're saying. laughs> Do you think the old masters had a version of that for a live event? That's a really good question. Wow. Yeah, what would that be? Those old masters were had fun too. Totally. They yeah. weren't just sitting in like, you know, candlelight just all depressed. I mean, oh, some no. obviously some of them were, but not all of them. Well, a lot of them would invite their apprentices to you know, render a specific element. So in that sense it was kind of a community effort mm-hmm. for a lot of these works, especially like Rubens and some of these masters that had you know 20 or 30 apprentices um and i wonder to what degree those apprentices were kind of being subversive in their own way trying to kind of give like a fuck you to the, the boss obviously <laughs> i mean they had yeah. to i mean because we yeah. all we all do that to bosses there's untold penises within there's always a dick in there somewhere <laughs> untold, <laughs> untold penises within international women's day there we go yeah that should be the next show Aaron. <laughs> yeah do you ever do you ever wonder what the old, one of the old masters would would think or see uh, when they saw one of your pieces? I mean, I bet some degree of envy because so much of so many of those artists were bound by commission. You know, mm. they they had to find opportunity to, for self expression within the confines of you know stringent commission guidelines, um, especially early on, where if the church was commissioning you, oh yeah. You know, like you did not want to mess that up. Like the, mm. the consequences were dire. <laughs> you know, you, like you're talking about like being flayed. Just exiled from yeah. society. Yeah. yeah just... That would be the best case yeah, right. scenario, <laughs> yeah. you know. I mean, do you think they were making on the side, like paintings they were shoving under their bed that were just for fun? Well, recent um, like conservation has revealed uh, that they would hide things underneath uh, the paint layers. That's like. The... You know, so they they would express themselves and then paint over it, knowing that they couldn't um, layers, show that stuff. Layers of phallicis, just. yeah, or, or like kind of subversive inside jokes that you know these the the certain people wouldn't understand, but like your your fellows would would get. That's fascinating. But that's yeah. the thing is that we think of the past masters of just there was no sense of humor back then, which is totally. I mean, Shakespeare kind of broke that down because he was very funny, but like it's just weird how I always think of like this. Oh, they were just laboring. They just yeah, always, there's, always there's one like real cons- lowbrow scene, right? In yeah, the Dutch it, Golden Age. Yeah, yeah. You know, like that were not they were not accepted by the mainstream art world at the time. Yeah, you know, it, I love that period of history. All my favorite painters were like the lowbrow artists of that era. You know, like painting it's, like brothel scenes or mm-hmm. scenes in bars or even like painting a forest floor still life was seen as kind of low and not of like high culture because it wasn't being commissioned by somebody of, of, of notoriety. Is that? Yeah. Or it wasn't speaking to the greatest quote unquote, greatest ideals of the time, you know, like what was their motivation for forest floor still lives? I think it was the, er, it was proto naturalism. So this was right at the time when the microscope was being like 1620s is kind of when the Sada Bosco forest floor still life was being invented. And, that was totally low culture. That would be lowbrow art at the time. So then that's interesting because we're talking, you know, lowbrow, obviously, uh, juxtaposed in other publications and social media, really, have kind of like allowed lowbrow to thrive in the, um, son of a bitch, have, al- have allowed lowbrow to thrive 
<laughs> I think you're taking control of the process <laughs> back here. Yeah. Um, I've yeah. allowed it to thrive in, in interesting ways where it doesn't, it's not really lowbrow anymore. You can't really call it lowbrow. Yeah. It's kind of had its... The audience is so broad. In <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, it's not just the tastemakers or, like, the exclusive people that buy from mm -hmm. particular galleries or hang, like, particular things in their house. It's, like, such a broad spectrum. Like, just talking about... It's uni, bro. Some of the people that have, like... <laughs> it's bought your work from the show it's like <laughs> tattoo artists all the way up to like big art foundations so like everything in between right yeah and then but the following on, on social media for both of us is like it's everyone so it's mm -hmm. art people and it's just people that only appreciate art through instagram and that might be the only way they see it right um, but it does democratize everything right like, yeah yeah and it's i think it's showing like what do people really want to look at in last yeah. night, not to name drop too much, but I mean, it's awesome that Mark Ryden showed up last amazing. night. Oh, and amazing. he's like, you know, the no, king of, uh, yeah. you know, it's actually funny. I, I was in line at the Armory show getting a drink and I turned around and Mark was there. He's like, we both like pointed at uh, each other. I'm like, hey, what's up? Um, which is good to see, like, because he's such a king of this whole scene. Yeah. yeah. But he, he, it's like, he's not really low. I mean, he's not really low brown anymore. He's, well, got, he's, he's, is a, he's established it such a fantastic way that mm -hmm. is, he's such a foundational piece to like art of the last 25 years. Although some people would say, you know, maybe some people would be like, it's still kitschy, but like that's part of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, so it's fascinating to just think about low brow of the 1600s and then. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, all it really means is that it's somehow outside of the acceptable mainstream art world you yeah. know whatever that means at the time i mean it, it's it's kind of a it, you know it doesn't mean a whole lot i mean mm -hmm. i've I heard it defined in a, in ways that contradict one another which yeah it's interesting like the division doesn't hold anymore like now it's just it's it's like an aesthetic umbrella to talk about what lowbrow is but those artists can be showing like mark Ryden shows at casman and there's plenty of artists who would be working in what we think of as like lowbrow but have you ever style or lowbrow aesthetic? But they're in, they're inside. Like nobody it doesn't right. keep you outside anymore. Right. Have you ever thought about what that actually means, though? Lowbrow or highbrow? It. I think it doesn't. It describe the, re the reaction of the viewer. So if it's lowbrow, the tendency mm. is to be kind of like, <laughs> you know, would look a, a bit of scorn, yeah. like lowering the brow. Whereas highbrow is like, you know, exalted. Yeah, oh, yeah, and it's weird because like I, I I can't remember if Robert Williams found found our jokes because I don't know if he used lowbrow or if he used pop surrealism or if he hated pop surrealism and liked lowbrow. Right. I can't remember what what he and when he used to kind of like give me the history of the scene kind of stuff. I, I think he leaned more towards lowbrow actually than he did pop surrealism. I think he thought pop surrealism sounded kind of fishy. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> He's not going to listen to this. I don't think he has a phone. Aaron, I wanted to ask you, with regard to the kind of the Trump monster and the like, the audience is kind of like really, yeah, kind of monstrous figures, that kind of work. That was, I believe you were making that pre, that was campaign Trump. I made it after I... he was elected, but it was like a Trump rally. We're two years in. If you were to remake that piece, if and uh, would it have changed in any way? If so, how? That's a good question. Um, the way I painted him in that painting was the way that I was having these visions of him before he was elected, which was just like a, a, like a spiraling vortex of teeth as the face and a spiraling vortex of teeth as his belly. So just like a hungry, voracious, greed machine, just like a black hole that was just going to swallow up all of humanity. With a with a micro penis, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly, like the tiniest possible, <laughs> and a swastika, um, a swastika shadow. And it's funny. I was I made that piece as a one-off thing for the Art on Paper Fair because I was asked to do one piece for that fair, and I was like, I've got this Trump idea. I want to get it out of my head. Like, I don't want to make a whole series of these. I don't want him coming into like my main body of work, but I can make this one. So I don't know if I was going to paint another one. I think I would. It would be the same, but just um amplified maybe i don't know just like a dark black room with this like spiraling vortex of greed like i don't know something like that but you don't uh, seem too excited about that <laughs> <laughs> I, do. I just don't want to give him i don't even want to talk about him right now i don't really want to give him any more space you know mm. it takes up too much yeah he gets so much space you haven't, All right. you haven't brought trump into a painting have you 
No, I mean, I don't look outward. Yeah. It's all mm. internal. So implicit, it's an all implicit in of there. Of course, right. But yeah. no, I don't, I haven't felt, like, I don't feel like I'm qualified to be uh, a social critic. Like I, I got to figure out my own shit. Yeah. You mm. know, clean up my side of the street before I kind of start pointing the finger. I mean, I have a lot of like flippant ideas, but it would just be that. It would be, you know, like I just don't think I'm qualified. I think there's smarter people to take care of that particular need, which I do think it's a, is a need. Right. But that's not my job. Right. Um, my job is looking inward and like how do we, how do we do the work that's necessary to be, a, you know, better individuals in, in our community, in our country, in our world. Um, so there you go. That was Aaron Johnson and Christian Rex Van Minen in conversation. If you enjoyed that, make sure you subscribe to the channel wherever you're walking in from. And we'll be with you guys real soon.